I'd ask you to open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. The average American is exposed, listen to this, this is hard to believe, the average American is exposed to 4,000 to 10,000 advertisements per day. What? From billboards to pop-up ads, website, little side ads that sit there, signs that we see, uh, TV and radio commercials, and product placement. Even now when you're on a streaming service and you pause it, it pops up a commercial there as well. They're everywhere. Uh, Leanne and I were watching a show on Friday, and it was talking about the very first product placement. I'll, I'll, let, I'll give you a hint. It was a candy bar. Anybody have a guess? Hershey. No, it wasn't Hershey. It was somebody trying to take down Hershey. The Butterfinger. And guess who? It was given to a little girl named Shirley Temple. So a long time. You guys even know who Shirley Temple is? All right. <laughs> Little girl that was in literally every movie from 1930 on, I think. But uh, apparently it works, right? Else the industry wouldn't be selling that many ads. It's, it's booming, of course. The purpose is for us typically to buy a product. Uh, but there is also a push in advertising, if we really watch for it. There's a push for conformity, that we would all do the same thing. This great melting pot of America, we all like the same drinks, right? Nobody likes Pepsi. We all like Coke, right? All right? There's this conformity, the same restaurants, the same dish detergent, the places for vacation, and on and on and on. Now, that's all fine for products. But what happens? What happens when society demands conformity when it reaches into our beliefs, when it reaches our faith, the push for conformity. It's either accomplished in one way of conformity by seduction or seducing, to put it in a less sensual way, or by force. We're looking at the seven churches of Revelation, and last week, we saw Smyrna. They were a church that were battling and they were being, trying to be conformed by the world. And their attempt there was by persecution. Today we come to the church of Pergamos, the third church mentioned. And here the church that we're, that we're seeing faced both persecution and also seduction to conform to the world. Now, where is Pergamos? What is Pergamos? Well, it's another one of those cities in Turkey, modern-day Turkey. It was the capital city of Asia Minor. You can see it there, the ones below that. We started with Ephesus, the one farthest south, then it moved up into Smyrna, and then now we're up to the very top, and it'll swing back around. It makes that loop, uh, all of these cities. It's north of Smyrna, 20 miles from the Aegean, Medi Aegean Sea, Mediterranean Sea. The Greeks said that it was founded by the son of Hercules. Well, we know that's not true, but that's what they claimed. And unlike other cities that had been conquered by Rome, the Roman Empire came in and took them, this was not the case. In fact, in 133 BC, Attalus, or Attalus uh, III bequeathed his kingdom to the Roman Empire. So that gave them a little better status within the empire, and it became the capital of Asia Minor. Now, it was filled, like all the other cities, with great temples, but this had some even greater ones. It had one to Athena and Dionysus and, uh, As I can never say this right, Asclepios, um, and the, the great temple of Zeus. That was its real claim. And like Smyrna, it also had, we mentioned this a lot last week, where they worshipped Caesar. In fact, they had three temples to the different Caesars over, over the time. But the famous thing of all of this city was it was known for its great library. It had the second largest library of the ancient world. It had 200,000 volumes. Now, put that in, uh, in your mind. These were handwritten books. 
All right, this wasn't, you know, you put it on the printer. These were handwritten notes, so 200,000 of them. And the difference between those versus the top library, the largest library was in Alexandria, Egypt. The difference between them was most of the ones in Pergamos were written on parchment. They were written on skins or on, on, on paper. Prior to the Roman Empire, when Pergamos was still a part of the uh, Adelid Empire, uh, the king there tried to lure away. Now, just got egos going here. He tried to lure away the, the librarian of the Alexandria uh, Library. His name was Aristophanes. Doesn't matter. But the Egyptian king, Ptolemy, he gets so angry by this that he stops the export of papyrus. All books had been made with papyrus at that point. So he stops that. He won't allow any more export of that. So they, with that, it necessitated some type of writing device there, writing uh, parchment that was created. So they started using uh, skins of animals, and they, they created what would be, eventually our, uh, would be eventually our paper. The word pergamus is synonymous with parchment. All right, so this, they're synonymous with each other. Just some interesting thing there. But being the capital city for the Roman Empire, they had the power to wield the sword of the empire for anyone that would not conform or that anyone that needed judgment. And we're going to see that's very important to this church later on. So it is with all of this in mind, we get to verse 12 of chapter 2 of Revelation. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days with Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast the stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent. Or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against thee with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give them a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, as we come to your word today, that we ask you to illuminate your word, our hearts, that we would understand and we could apply this in our life. I ask you to be with those possibly that are hurting today and they are being forced into conformity in different areas of their life that contrary to your word, that we would be given faith, that we would be given strength in this time. Be with those that don't know, that don't know Christ as their Savior, that you would draw them to you. They would come to know Christ today. In Jesus' name, amen. So, we see first here in verses 12 and 13 how they had dwelt, how this church had dwelt. Just like the church in Smyrna, we see this church, they're dealing with some persecution in their life. Now, this is a two-part sermon. I'm just going to warn you. I was talking to Brother Jeff beforehand. This is a two-part sermon. I thought I could get it all in this morning. It's not going to happen. So, you need to come back tonight. It's important. It's important. Tonight is important. You need to hear this. And if you don't come back tonight, please, please, please watch it online because this goes together. This whole message needs to be heard together. So get online, come here uh, tonight, and be here. But we're going to see the first part of this today. A lot of their persecution, we're going to see in verse 13, was due to their location. This is an interesting phrase here. It says there, that you see where they dwelt, where Satan's seat is. Do you ever feel like that's where you're at? We're living where Satan's seat is. Well, that's what they were feeling like. And that's what God says, because at the end of the verse, he says it again, where Satan dwells. This wasn't a question of, was it that way? No, this is where it was. And as you study this, you find several thoughts of what this might be. What does that mean, where Satan's seat is? Well, there's a lot of speculation. Some people think maybe it was due to the temple of Zeus. 
This is a replica of what they feel the Temple of Zeus looked like. It's in the uh, museum in Berlin. Part of that frieze along the bottom of that are, is, is real. They uncovered that and they reconstructed this temple. It is said that the, the, uh, the throne with the statue of Zeus was some 30 to 40 feet high. Maybe it was because of that. Maybe it was due to the temple of Asclepius, the god of healing. The symbol with the snake around there where we have our modern day symbol for doctors. This whole, this whole thought of the Satan and the snake, we don't know. Maybe it was due to the worship of Caesar, like we mentioned last week. It might be a combination of all that. But ultimately, though, we can know for sure it dealt with the fact that this was where the seat of judgment was in Asia Minor. This is where Rome had their thumb they wielded the sword against those that did not or would not comply. And as we will see later in this verse, this is, um, it talks about how one of their members, a man named Antipas, died by their hands. But look at verse 12, and we see here, this gives us the tie-in to know that this is because of the judgment seat. In this first verse, uh, 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 and actually at the first verse of each of the letters to the churches, Jesus always describes himself in some way dealing, showing his real power versus what the church or what the government might have thought their power was. For Ephesus, Jesus says that he was holding the seven stars, meaning either the angels or the pastors there, and he was walking among the seven churches. He was in the midst of them. He was in control of what was going on. When we saw Smyrna, it said, Jesus says, I am the first and the last. That city that thought they were the first of all of Asia was their title there. They were not that. that he was the one in control. And now we get to Pergamos. And Jesus said, These things saith he that hath the sharp sword with two edges. The two-edged sword. Satan might have had civil power over the people, but Jesus was letting the church know for encouragement that the real power was in him. And no matter what happens in Ohio, in the United States, in this world, the real power is in the hands of God. The two-edged sword is a title. It is a descriptor of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Word, and the Word and the two-edged sword are synonymous. Let's use the Word of God to explain the Word of God. In Hebrews 4.12, you see there, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the, the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents and intents of the heart. We see here that Jesus... God the Son is the true judge. He tells us that He is the discerner of our hearts. He is the divider. We see this two-edged sword show up again in Revelation chapter 19. This time in, uh, in the battle of Armageddon, verse 15, it says, Out of His mouth, Jesus' mouth, goeth a sharp sword, that with it it should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron and treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. It is a two-edged sword. Now, why, why the two edges? What, what does that mean? Have you ever thought about that? A sword's a sword in, in my mind, right? But no, 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 this two-edged sword, is, is, there's a reason for that saying. The one side of that two-edged sword, it represents the, the promises of the Word of God. The message of salvation through His name that cuts loose the chains of sin that bind every man and every woman and boy and girl that put their faith in Jesus Christ. But on the other side, what we just read there in Revelation, it represents the condemnation of those that refuse Jesus Christ and His grace. It's good for us and if we refuse, it is bad for us. It is a two-edged sword. Walver put it this way, the Word of God is both an instrument of salvation and the instrument of death. It is upon what we will choose. And Jesus describes Himself 
as this two-edged sword to bolster, to encourage the people in this church that are being persecuted, that are being tried to be conformed into the image where Satan's seat was. And he says to them, he commends them, and he says, for holding fast two things, for holding fast my name, he says. Holding fast Jesus' name. They had continued in the name of being a Christian. They did not fall away from that and, and deny the name of Jesus Christ. They proudly said, as we talked about last week, of the dear saint that got up and said, I am a Christian. Can we proudly say that we are Christians? It wasn't a hidden part of their identity, something that maybe only their family and those closest to them knew about them. No, they said, I am a Christian. They took Matthew 10, 32 to heart when Jesus said, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. You and I are known by several of our characteristics. You might be looked at and somebody says, there is a hardworking person. There is a courteous young man. There is a young lady, she's very funny. This guy, he's, he is very athletic. He's intelligent. She's intelligent. But I pray that the first moniker for each of us is the name Christian. They look at you and they say, he's a Christian. She's a Christian. They know by how you live your life. It needs to be self-evident with our life and our practices. Now, don't be that guy at work that goes around saying, yeah, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, and then everyone, every, everyone else has to do your work. I'd rather you just not talk at that point, all right? Stop talking, start walking, all right? I am a Christian. You are a Christian. And hold fast to that name. And it ties then to the next thing that Jesus commended them for. He said, hold fast in my name, but he also says, holding fast my faith. Now this one expands upon that. This is living out that term of being a Christian. Living out your Christian faith. Living out the doctrines of his instruction. The word of God. And we know that they have been doing this because the word faith that's used there... It's something that means it was completed. This was something they had done. And it's connected then to that next phrase that talks about Antipas's martyrdom. We don't know who Antipas was, but he definitely was a member of this church. And Jesus calls him my faithful martyr. It links them with Jesus. If you go back to uh, chapter 1 and verse 5 and all those descriptions of Jesus, Jesus Christ calls himself the, the, the witness there. And that same word is interpreted here, martyr, my faithful witness. He talks about my, my name, my faith, and my faithful martyr. They were and remained faithful even during a time of persecution. We have to ask ourselves, Am I keeping the name of Jesus Christ? Is it the moniker I am known by? Am I living out the Lord's faith? Jesus called it my faith. It was His. Now we hear people talk all the time about their walk with the Lord, their walk of faith like it's ours. And it is to a certain extent. I understand that. The very personal nature of this. But this really, when it says my faith, Get this, please. This really points to the necessity of your faith being in line with the Word of God. Being in line with God. His faith de defined by His Word. Not by what I want it to be, but defined by His Word. We don't have the right to define it in our terms. We can't exchange it for another gospel. Or change the church and the, the mission of our faith to another focus. Now let me get to that. Paul warned them in the Galatians. Our Sunday school class just finished that book up. And they were, the people were getting off track. And he says in Galatians 1, verse 6 and 7, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from Him that called you in the grace of Christ unto what? Another gospel which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. 
We are not to change the gospel to another. He tells us here it is perverting it. God telling you are perverting his gospel when we change it. We're not to change it. We're not to water it down. For example, we should care for those in our community. Amen? We should. But things like social gospel, social justice, are not the gospel of Jesus Christ. They simply aren't. The gospel of Jesus Christ, we're told in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3, Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried the third day according to the Scriptures. And He tells us in Romans 10, Paul says in verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Salvation through grace. Within the doctrine, we find instruction. If we continue in the doctrine of Christ after salvation... By all means, we find instruction to care for our fellow man. By all means, we should do this, but not by submitting the gospel to a secondary status. All else is secondary to the gospel because without the soul of a person being healed through the salvation of Jesus Christ, anything else we are doing to the body is just a band-aid on a dead man. We need to keep the gospel first and foremost, his faith. And Jesus commended them for holding fast his name and his faith. Now, let me point one other thing out in this verse. In all seven of the churches that we're going to read about, and we see the phrase, I know thy works. He says it every time. I know thy works. But this one, he adds something afterwards. I know thy works, but in this he says, and where thou dwellest. Where thou dwellest. In the study of this phrase, this is not pointing out the dwelling like, I stayed the night in Pergamos and I left the next day. Which is very interesting because Paul and Peter constantly are telling us to be pilgrims, to have that mindset of a pilgrim or a sojourner, that we are traveling through, this place is not our home, that type of mentality. But we see here, Jesus was commending them for a very meaningful fact. They, this dwell means that they were planted. This was home for them. This is where God had placed them. Now, let's read that phrase again and so we can get a full grasp of it. He says, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith. You are bearing your Christian witness even where it, it is toughest. You are bearing your Christian witness even where it is most needed. You are bearing your Christian faith even when it will result in persecution in your life. Do we think of that where we're at? Where you're working, where you go to school, where you uh, have your house and your neighborhood, that God has placed you there, it is where you dwell. Throughout church history, we have found people, Christians, that have decided to leave culture, and they'll go up into monasteries, up in some mountain or into some cove. This monastic life is the term. But God has planted us right dab in the middle of Satan's seat for a reason. Light does not need to shine on another light. Salt does not need to purify other salt. We don't go away and hide ourselves away. Our missionary brother Jake Woodfin that's in San Francisco, branches churches that he's planting there, is planted right dab in the middle of San Francisco. Why? Because they need a faithful witness of Jesus Christ. Our missionaries in the Middle East and North Korea and Taiwan and Guinea have all been planted exactly where God wanted them to be. But Friendship Baptist, we have been planted right here. It doesn't matter what society is doing in Cincinnati. It doesn't matter what society is doing in Ohio, the, the country. It doesn't matter. We have been planted to be the church right here. 
And that means we need to be in our community. We need to be among them. We need to be in our neighborhoods. We need to be known. And we need to know our neighbors. We need to be on our ball teams. And we need to be in the societies of our, of our, of our, of our country here and in our city. As much as God will allow us so that we can be a witness and remain faithful to His church. One of the joys that I've found in the last few years of living in the Coleraine area now for an extended period of time is I now know the folks. I know them. When I, when I go to UDF down the street, I know the people that work inside. I know them by name. I've, I've had opportunities to pray with some of them when they had surgeries. I know them. They know me. I know the people by name at Chick-fil-A. It's sort of embarrassing when my wife comes in and they say, Hi, Keith. Oh. <laughs> I know the waiters at La Rosa's. Yeah, I like to eat. I know the waiters at La, La Pinata. So do a lot of you. All right? <laughs> I know my dry cleaner. Leanne has a good relationship with the lady who runs our dry cleaning. That owns the dry cleaners. They're Robinson Cleaners. Name drop. And... Um, I know them, and they know me. And it gives me an opportunity to shine the light of Christ in this community, in my corner of the world, in Friendship Baptist's corner of the world. And we need to be seen, and we need to be known. And keeping Jesus' name and keeping Jesus' faith as we live our life. Don't put away your faith. As you draw up through the youth group and you go out on your own, there is that tendency, if you haven't made your faith your own, to allow that to subside. And you, don't want to be, you don't want to be embarrassed. You don't want to be known by that. I encourage you, stay steadfast in the name of Jesus Christ. Let your friends and your colleagues know. Don't allow yourself to abandon your faith at whatever age it might be. This is a powerful letter, and we see how they had dwelt, holding fast Jesus' name and Jesus' faith. Tonight, we're going to go to the next verses, and we're going to see how they were dwelling. And we'll see Jesus has two problems with them. This is an advertisement for tonight. Come back. It'd be better, <laughs> Brother Jeff, says, it'll be better tonight than it was this morning, all right? You say, it couldn't, couldn't be worse. Okay. Okay. Um, Jesus has two problems with them. And unfortunately, we're going to see they are still around today. They're unfortunately alive and well in the churches of today. And we'll see how the seduction of the world has made them so appealing to us if we're not careful. He deals with two doctrines, the doctrine of Balaam and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. But as we close tonight, today, I want to go to the last verses. I want to encourage you. As you've been planted here in Cincinnati, keeping Jesus' name, keeping Jesus' faith, we see how they had dwelt and had courage, the courage it took. And now look what, how they will dwell. How we will dwell in the future of our life. Jesus has three gifts that He wants to give to them. He tells them there in verse 17, He says, I will give to eat of the hidden manna. He is going to provide aid to them, and He's going to provide aid to us. What is manna? Psalm 78, 24 says, and had, and had rained down manna upon them to eat, and had given them of the corn of heaven, it says. Man did eat angels' food. He sent them meat to the full. Now, this is obviously symbolic. This is speaking of the food that the Lord had provided for the Israelites as they wandered through the wilderness for 40, for 40 years. And every morning they would go out and they would collect this food that God had provided for them. Instead of the Israelites having the meat of Egypt, the world, they were provided for by God. The Lord instructed Moses and Aaron to keep a bowl of this manna, and it was put up and placed before the Ark of the Covenant, before the mercy seat of God, behind the veil, the hidden manna. And the church of Pergamos may have been giving up things to the world. 
You might feel today you are giving up things of the world to follow Jesus Christ. And it's probably true. You are. At some point, it will be true. We all give up something of this world to follow our Lord and Savior, to, be, to follow and be faithful to His name and to His faith. And God is telling him here that, that promising them spiritual food. The things the world doesn't have. It's hidden from the world. It's something that we only have. There is great strength and aid in the secret manna of fellowship with God. You can trade nothing for the fellowship of God. Having that fellowship that He is there with you at every moment, no matter what is happening in your life, doesn't matter if everyone else has forsaken you, God is there. And that is the secret manna, that aid that He gives us, that strength, that fellowship. And if you live this uncompromised life in your faith, He will strengthen you. He will be there for you. He also says, I will give a white stone. Not just aid, but also acceptance. When you're being shunned by everyone else, and now you come before God, and His arms are open for you. The acceptance of your Heavenly Father, knowing that no matter where you go, no matter what you've done, no matter what someone else has done for you, He is there with His arms open wide, and there is an acceptance. You say, what in the world is this white stone? There's a lot of different theories of what that means. But all of them compact to this, acceptance. It is given to you. It is a sign of acceptance by Jesus Christ. And all that acceptance stems not just from, he gives us this body of believers, our family of Christ, there is acceptance there. He gives us that. And are we glad for that? I hope you are. If not, you need to become part of the family of God here. You need to, uh, even if you're a member, you need to come and know the people of this church. Let them be in your life and you in their life. There's, there's the acceptance there, but all of that stems first and foremost from being accepted by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The one that loved you so much that He sacrificed His life for you. Friend, have you accepted Jesus Christ? Has that stone that acceptance been given to you? It comes through Jesus Christ. And then the third thing we see here, not just the white stone, but it says there was going to be in a stone a new name. We see aid was given, we see assurance, and now we see acceptance, now we see the assurance of Jesus Christ. Ultimately, He gives us assurance that no matter what happens, we are His. Just like your child is always your child, we are His child. We have accepted Christ as our Savior. He is our Heavenly Father. And it is not, we talked about this in Sunday school today, it is not because of anything that you've done. Amen to that. It is all because of our faith and what He has done for us. We have a personal relationship with with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So no matter what the persecution may come, no matter the pressure to conform to something at school, to something at the workplace, whatever it might be, God is there for you. And He will give you the aid, the strength you need, knowing you're fully accepted, and there's nothing that can take you away from Him. What's the Lord doing in your heart today? Are you struggling? Are you about ready to conform, to cave in to that? Did you, need, did you need to hear the Lord say, I'm where with you today? Speak to the Lord. Allow Him to comfort. Allow Him to work in your life. And friend, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, none of that's listed there is yours. You're on a path away from the Lord that will last for eternity. Jesus Christ loved you. And God commendeth His love toward you and that while you were yet sinner, He died for you. Amen. Will you accept that? Will you accept Christ as your Savior? We're going to come to a time of invitation here in a moment. And our altar is here and there's going to be altar workers there. And they would love to open the Word of God with you and share with you how you can accept Christ as your Savior today. Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word as we looked at the first part of this church of Pergamos. 
and how they were faithful, even in persecution, to conform, living right there in the, the central of where Satan's activity was. But you place them there, and you're going to give them strength while they're there. And it's no different for us, dear Heavenly Father. We know you've planted us here. Help us to be faithful to your faith. Help us to keep your name on our lips and how we live our life. Be with those that don't know Christ today, dear Heavenly Father. Draw them to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.